Hey friends, it is Tech Sags Rewind. Hope you guys are having a great day. Why do people hate A&M? If you're one of those that hates A&M and you're like searching for stuff on YouTube, why, why is Paul Feinbaum saying this is a make or break year? You tell me what you think. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter uh, what they think. Just comment below. We'll, we'll look into those here uh, on the show and beyond. want to remind you that uh, this show is brought to you by T-Mobile. They want to remind you to visit T-Mobile.com slash across America to learn how you can get value and coverage through T-Mobile. So on the show today, uh, the Go Hour. We talked a little bit about pollen because our buddy Sam Kamen's car is disgusting. I saw a picture of it. It's filthy. How bad is your uh, car doing right now with all the pollen in the air? Call Station is not looking good when it comes to that. CT joined us, Chris Taylor. We talked spring game with him. He had some thoughts and observations. A recruiting country with Ryan Broniger. We had Bronny on for a couple hours today. He was great. Appreciate his time on here. And Aggie Baseball, they're winning, and it feels so, so good. The victory over uh, A&M Corpus Christi. Uh, we talked to Kendall Rogers from D1 Baseball and broke it all down here on Tex Ags Rewind. Talking points during talking season. Yeah. And they're getting a lot of run off of this because what AM did on the recruiting trail last cycle has made everybody mad. It upset the apple cart so much that I think some of these talking heads nationally have figured out that if I bring this up, I get a ton of interaction because there's so many people in Tuscaloosa, Baton Rouge, Austin, Norman, Athens, Gainesville that are all upset about this. And they think AM's cheating to this insane degree and I can bring this up and for a show that is as kind of combative as Feinbaum he's found some common ground some commonality over from rival fan bases and it's gotten them real stirred up you know to attack a and together so I don't know that it's anything other than uh, a talking season right get eyeballs on me kind of thing. I think that's some of the most insightful stuff you've said, and, not, and I don't mean that as a joke, because I think you're exactly right. There is a point of the year what, with what we do as a job that we need to talk about things, not just news. We need to make a conversation. And I'm not into hot sports takes and riling up callers and text messages. That's just not my style. I like to talk things out. We can discuss, move on. Uh, but there is a style, Colin Cowherd, to throw out a hot sports take and he's really good at it, and, and I think Feinbaum's good at it as well. And even if you believe it or not, you can say it in a certain way just to drum up interest to get your show filled for you. Um, and, I, and I think you might be right there. Well, that's why I think Josh Pate is the best at what those guys do right now when I'm talking about those guys that, that sit there singularly and have a radio show. Yep. Feinbaum, Cowherd, Josh Pate, they sit there by themselves and have a radio show. Now, I know that Cowherd's got some people he interacts with, uh, Feinbaum obviously has all of his callers, but like you're the main focus on camera. You come up with all the talking points. It's up to everybody else to react to you. And I think Josh Pate is, sits there by himself with no help and carries cogent, cohesive thoughts for 45 minutes straight. And all of them tend to make sense. Their logic, they've been thought out. He highlights good and bad of each situation. That's why I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm a, a Pate fan. He is not a hot sports take guy. He may have some, no, some he, takes, but, but it's not like polarizing. Right. right. But So he's not into the shock jock stuff to right. where I, I need to say this to get my ratings up. I think his approach is I'm going to make a cohesive argument for one thing. It's not going to be a hot take. This is what I think about the Jimbo Fisher and A&M situation. See, see, one of the things I'm super excited about is the fact that you can lose a guy like Isaiah Spiller to the NFL, and you might be better at running back. Not because he's gone, but like with A-Chain getting some some runs and also LJ, Amari, um, Moss. I mean, you, you're going to look pretty good at the running back spot again. I just continuing that tradition of really good running backs at A&M. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it's a deep running back room. And so, you know, I, I think that you know, in, in today's, you know, day and time, you don't have that one guy that just, he pounds you 30 times a game. Now, you know, Isaiah could do that if called to do it, but now you've got a bunch of guys that I think they specialize in different roles. You know, we know what A-Chain can do. He's a home run hitter. We know what Anias is able to do when you throw him back there. But then you start bringing in those big backs, LJ. Um, you know, I've had a chance to see him a couple of times and, and watch him work out. That's a big dude. I think yeah. when you, they have him listed at 205, he looks much bigger than 205. Um, and, and so then you've got Moss coming in, and, and, and um, you know, the young man, 24, his name, you know, escapes me now. 
but they have a loaded room. I mean, and, and that's what I said, you know, when we, we started this segment, the, the, the talent and the depth that Jimbo has been able to build and establish with this football team, man, they should be really, really good at a lot of key positions. And, you know, there are some guys that left, you know, whether, you know, graduated or to the draft, but they have some really good guys ready to step in and play a big role for this football team. Hey, man, let's uh, let's talk a little Bravion Rogers with you. Um, I know you did the show yesterday, but a little bit after the, the news broke. Tell us uh, how big this one is. Well, this one's exciting. Um, look, as A&M, you know, as they expand that scope nationally, you know, and they go out and they, they just kind of, you know, feel like they're just plucking five stars from all over the country, right? Uh, hand-picking. One thing you can't forget, and A&M certainly has not forgotten Texas talent. They, they absolutely kicked ass the last two years in state. That was once a narrative, right? Like, oh, A&M, you know, they're not mining the home state, which was always fake anyway. Uh, that was just what some of the detractors were trying to say as Jimbo was building momentum. Uh, you were talking about one of those detractors a second ago that I want to circle back to and find bomb. Yep. But you cannot lose sight of what's in your backyard. And LaGrange, you know, the last Big time guy to come out of LaGrange. You, you saw go to Ohio State and J.K. Dobbins. Uh, that area of the state, LaGrange, Columbus, uh, Sealy, Belleville, that, Brenham, there are time periods where they'll all of a sudden pop up quite a bit of you know high end D1 talent. Um, and you, you can't neglect locally here in the Brazos Valley. There's plenty out there. So in, in your quest to go put together, you know, this national championship program, I think some of these small town guys around here can flat out play. And they did it last year with Jared Kerr, who was a tremendous football player. And they're doing it this year. And Bravion's a guy that I've had a lot of people, a lot of people talk to me about uh, leading up to, you know, here in the last, oh, I'd say two months, coaches. In, in the state, in a smaller school level that have coached against him or that have seen him or heard of him that have just said, and this is a, uh, he's a special player. And, and they've also said, we hear he wants to go to A&M. So I was really excited, you know, when A&M did offer him, um, you know, he's a thousand yard back. He had, uh, I think almost 400 yards receiving, playing defensive back. He's a return guy. He's got verified tracks. Speed, okay that that's pretty significant as well and he's also look he, he's a good size defensive back prospect too you know he's i he, I, I see him a lot of times listed at 5 10 185 he's a little taller than that i think he's more of the 511 range um could end up being a shade under six foot he, he's built exactly like you want to see it at the cornerback spot he can play corner he can play safety he can play it kind of reminds you of like guys like bryce anderson like Smoke Bowie, uh, you want to see, I mentioned Kerr, you want to see guys like that patrolling your secondary. And by that, I'm, by like that, I mean elite athletes that at the high school level kind of did everything for their team because they were that good. So, yeah, I, I think this was a big one. Um, you go back and look at his early offer list, and you see teams like Alabama and Georgia. And when you're playing in a small town, uh, like LaGrange, you're not in the class, you know, 5, 6A, and you're getting seen by teams like that that early in the process. That tells you something about your reputation uh, in Texas high school football circles. So that's a good one, man. That's a really good one. And I think it's a, I think it's the tip of the iceberg, what they're going to do in the secondary. And I think we're going to look up, Nino, I think we're going to look up at two positions after this cycle. And you're going to say, okay, now that looks like the A&M D-lines look like. Would you like for me to get into what I did yesterday? Yeah, get right all. Let's get through it. I mean, yeah, so it was something that A&M obviously started generating that momentum throughout the weekend. If you go back, he was, <clears throat> excuse me, grew up a huge A&M fan, called A&M his dream school, and actually posted a picture on his Instagram yesterday when he committed uh, of him as a young child 
I guess they were building something at school, uh, and he it was like kind of like a birdhouse looking thing. Right. And he painted his maroon and white with an A and M logo on it. Um, so he grew up really wanting to come to A and M, and it was his dream school. And A and M was a little bit later with an offer, but um, you gotta understand, like we have the twenty twenty three class in state. DJ Durkin hasn't seen all these guys, so it's gonna take him a little bit to get around to all of them. A and M offers while he's on campus uh, a few weeks back. He returns the next weekend for spring game and visits. And then within a few days after that, he has announced his commitment to A&M. Uh, so the momentum there was something that we took note of right after the offer. And then um, you know, I, I wrote a long-form article about just recapping the weekend and some of the names that we felt extremely good about it. And Bravion's name was in that list of guys just off, based off everything we'd heard from our sources and contacts. And uh, drove down to LaGrange yesterday and talked to him during the athletic period, and he was, you know, huge weight off his shoulders kind of thing. And, um, you know, like I said, a was his dream school, so getting that offer meant a lot to him, and he didn't want to waste much time. He knew where he wanted to go, and he was appreciative of all the other offers that he'd gotten, and they're extensive. I mean, LSU, Georgia, Texas, USC, all over Michigan, all over the country. Uh, but he knew he wanted to be right down the road in, in College Station, and this is a kid, when you watch his tape, I mean, there's literally, like, you, you think he could excel at four positions at the next level. Play receiver, running back, corner, or safety. a and going to start him on the defensive side of the ball and kind of see where things go from there. But plays in fast forward. He's got verified track times, but it's kind of like that Devon A-chain thing. Like, there are guys that are fast and there are guys that are play fast. Bravion is both. He's fast and he plays exceptionally fast. He's got a knack for making a big play. I know last year they were playing Rockdale. Uh, Rockdale was lining up for a game-winning field goal. Bravion blocks the field goal, picks it up, and runs it back to win the game for LaGrange. So kind of a knack for making that big play. And, you know, you go back to guys like J.K. Dobbins that have come out of LaGrange, and that's a small town that's got a pretty high hit rate when they send guys to Division One programs. So big-time get, important need, important get for this class. Uh, and you want – you know, it's not necessarily a – a determining factor of success on a weekend is the number of commits that you get coming out of it. Because, you know, some of these kids, like last weekend is going to be the groundwork, uh, the foundation for some of these commitments that are to come down the road. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on the BCSI hotline, talking all things college baseball and Texas A&M. Let's turn our attention to Tennessee. They dropped one yesterday uh, after being so, so good. Uh, just they are still, though, last week you you said they are the best, and uh, one loss isn't going to change that. But uh, it's been a while since they had lost. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I you know, I totally don't think Tony Vitello, you know, was doing this on purpose, but it's just funny that, that it was a couple weeks ago against Vanderbilt, they're like, oh, you know, aluminum bats, wood bats, we'll, you know, we'll smash anything. Well, they, they play with wood bats, he gets shut down by a guy who had a ERA of seven. So, you know, I don't think there's anything to take from that, but like it's just kind of funny that they end up playing with that and that happens. But you know, I, I've said this you know, time and time again. I think if you're Tennessee, uh, you want to be you want to be kicked in the mouth a little bit. Like it, it, this is a long season, I and mean, if you play at that ridiculously high of a level all year long, it's just really really hard to emulate that in the postseason. So I actually really like their demeanor after the game last night. So you know, Joel uh, Ortega. Uh, you know, the post game press conference at Tennessee Tech had a pretty boisterous celebration, as you might imagine. And somebody asked him, Well, you know, were you offended by that or whatever? He said, Hey, we're like the first team that, you know, we're, when we win, we're the first team and we're the loudest team to celebrate, you know, probably take things a little too far. Hey, you know what? They beat us and they deserve to do that. So, like, I actually like that attitude out of Tennessee. Like, hey, we, we're loud and proud, but like, hey, if other teams beat us, they're more than welcome to do it. They've, they've earned that right. Thank you so much for watching. want to ask you guys to comment on whatever we talked about today. I know we had some great stuff and some average stuff. So comment on the average stuff first, then the great stuff. Like, subscribe, do all the good stuff, share it, tell your people. It is Tech Sacks Rewind. We'll see you next time.